Um, especially given the kindness that Professor Scott has shown to me, I wish that my lecture were on a cheerier topic today. Um, that's not really going to be the case. Uh, but given the state of classical studies, and more generally given the state of the humanities in contemporary American higher education, I think that it's crucial for us to discuss uh, our current pedagogical predicament and to suggest some remedies for the future. Uh, my remarks today are going to pertain in part to the lowly place of the contemporary humanities on American college campuses. And I'm going to focus on the proper goals of classical studies and the humanities and more generally what it means to be an educated person and what these things can tell us about what it means to be an educated person. For certainly, and I got some sense of this a little bit from every campus I've gone to, uh, classical studies seem to be limping along at institutions of higher learning in the United States. Not everywhere, but by and large I think that that's true. And as is even better known, there has been much recent hand-wringing about the prospects for the humanities and even for liberal education more generally uh, in our country. So that, for example, in 2010, the distinguished uh, uh, ancient philosopher and political theorist Martha Nussbaum felt compelled to publish a, a little manifesto called Not for Profit, Why Democracy Needs the Humanities. And in 2015, even television's Fareed Zakaria got into the act with a brief tract he called In Defense of a Liberal Education. These are just two signs of a larger trend, I think, in which a number of American educators um, uh, and, and their supporters fret about the potential demise of the humanities and even about the demise of the liberal arts tradition itself as these subjects, particularly in the humanities, get swallowed up by a strictly vocational approach to higher learning. Such concerns, I think, are not idle. Sadly, prominent politicians of both major political parties in the United States have added fuel to the fire as they've very publicly questioned the value of the humanities and the liberal arts. As one politician put it, who won't be named, America needs more welders and fewer philosophers. Um, although I think he said less philosophers, which caused a certain amount of mirth when fewer would have been better. Um, some governors have even proposed charging undergraduates at their state institutions more for majoring in subjects that are seen as non-vocational. Understandably, this has caused a great deal of anxiety for those who support the humanities and more broadly, those who support the liberal arts tradition. I want to offer today uh, some history to explain these vicissitudes and to argue uh, in my talk today that regard for an earlier approach to the humanities can help us remedy our current predicament. If anything, my talk this afternoon is going to stress that the dominant approach to the meaning and value of higher education in America is impoverished. It will also argue that connecting with an earlier spirit of humanism can offer a more robust approach to education's value and revivify the humanities. My talk uh, stems from some of my research from my second book, which is fully titled Classics, The Culture Wars and Beyond, and has been published at, by the University of Michigan Press. I was going to say it's available at uh, fine bookstores everywhere, but I'm, I'm sure that's actually not true, and there probably are no fine bookstores anywhere uh, anymore. Uh, the book itself is a foray into the history of classical scholarship, and more specifically, the book attempts to examine the fate of American classical studies in an especially fraught period in the history of US higher education. Uh, pardon me as I take a drink. I'm glad that was filmed. Uh, according to many academics and intellectuals, the 1980s and 1990s in the U.S. witnessed an especially prominent public bat battle over cultural attitudes. Writers of various outlooks typically refer to this period as the heyday of the so-called American culture wars. The culture wars in the U.S. in the 1980s and 1990s surrounded such contentious topics as abortion, gay rights, affirmative action, multiculturalism, and even public funding for the arts. Somewhat surprisingly, I think, a major facet of the culture wars was an especially noisy and attention-grabbing debate on the subject of higher education in the United States. These, this academic culture war of the 1980s and 1990s, if you will, chiefly surrounded the nature of teaching and research in the humanities in American colleges and universities. It serves, as a result, as a particularly important period for those investigating the history and likely fate of classical studies and the liberal arts in U.S. higher education. So much of my book focuses on various scandals in American classical studies that took place in the context of the academic culture wars of the 1980s and 1990s. 
but the book also attempts to provide a brief intellectual history of the academic culture wars themselves. One major theme in this portion of the book is that classical studies played a surprisingly small part in the American academic culture wars. As I attempt to demonstrate in the book, the fights over the humanities in American colleges and universities in the late 20th century focused the large majority of their attention on the study of English literature, along with some of the new disciplines associated with the politics of the new left, like women's studies and black studies and so forth. And this led me to wonder, why did classical studies play such a small part in a long-standing and attention-grabbing debate on the nature of the humanities in American higher education? If Americans were so concerned about the humanities, why did the debates from the 1980s and 1990s concerning the humanities never seem to focus on the classics, the wellspring of the humanities themselves? In order to answer these questions, my book offers a brief history of the role of classics in American higher education, and I want to relay this afternoon some of that history to you, and for a number of reasons. So let me sketch out why. First, I think that this history of classics in American higher education can give you a good sense of the ways in which American higher education has fun fundamentally changed over time. Further, I think that this history forces us to think about the proper focus and role of higher education in America and what it means to be an educated person. In addition, I think that this history sheds light on some major troubles for both classical studies and also for the humanities in the decades to come. And I'm going to argue that we should reassert connections to an earlier tradition of humanism, which links education to salutary character formation. Although I'm sure that this is not going to prove a panacea, I'll argue that it is an important step in the right direction. In fact, I'll argue that it can reassert a desperately needed sense of purpose for the humanities, a sense of purpose that the humanities now lacks. Uh, I want to get to the day where taking a pause for a sip of water is not awkward, but I obviously have not gotten to that day and not anywhere close. It's not going to happen this afternoon. I, I apologize. Um, in order to offer some comments on the intellectual history and the plight of higher education, we're going to start with the Renaissance. So our discussion is going to start this afternoon in the Renaissance. Uh, to start very basically, we can say that the Renaissance occurred in Western Europe between the 14th and 16th centuries AD. The term Renaissance itself means rebirth in French, and it, also, it refers to the rebirth of knowledge from Greco-Roman antiquity. The term also signifies uh, the period that witnessed the rebirth of Western civilization as a result of the rediscovery of knowledge from ancient Greek and Roman civilizations. During the course of the Renaissance, beginning in Italy in the 14th century AD, numerous learned men and some learned women became extremely devoted to a study of the ancients, and more specifically to authors from Greco-Roman antiquity. This is very much related to the history of the so-called humanities. Naturally, the word humanities is still used in higher education circles today, including at Villanova. In contemporary parlance, the term humanities is kind of nebulous. It refers to a group of academic disciplines, essentially those that aren't in the hard sciences, those that aren't in the social sciences, and those that aren't in the fine arts, although sometimes people put the fine arts in the humanities. It thus encompasses today a number of contemporary academic disciplines, English, classics, German, French, philosophy, and so forth. So in contemporary parlance, the term humanities broadly refers to a number of academic disciplines, many of which revolve around the study of language. Yet this, I'm going to show, is very different from the original conception of a humanist, a term first employed by learned men and learned women during the Renaissance. The term humanities ultimately has an ancient Roman pedigree. In fact, as far as we can determine, it seems to stem from the Roman orator and statesman and writer Cicero. In a defense speech from 62 BC called the Pro Archia, or In Defense of Archaeus, Cicero referred to the, what he calls the Studia Humanitatis, or the studies of culture, or also could be called the studies of humanity, the Studia Humanitatis. In a number of his works, Cicero makes clear that the Studia Humanitatis are the same as the Artes Liberales, or the liberal arts, a term that is first used by Cicero in the extant literature. So he is the father, I guess, more specifically of the liberal arts tradition, although it's possible that other people use the term before him and only his use of it survives. 
That is to say, Cicero's discussion of the Studia Humanitatis pertained to his vision of the proper education for a member of the Roman elite. And thus the term liberal arts ultimately has a Roman pedigree, although there's some Greek uh, uh, ideas behind it. It originally refers to those subjects Cicero thought proper for the education of a freeborn person, a person for whom training in the liberal arts as opposed to the servile arts or technical skills was appropriate. Numerous learned men and some learned women in the course of the Renaissance used Cicero's thoughts on the Studia Humanitatis as a springboard for their own conception of the proper education of elites. In fact, these learned men and women deemed themselves humanists in a tip of the cap to Cicero. And they promoted a particular vision of education uh, that was originally rooted chiefly in Latin learning and ultimately rooted in Greek and Latin learning. The Renaissance promoted a type of education that would become institutionalized in Western colleges for hundreds of years. The earliest descriptions of the Renaissance humanist vision of education came from Coluccio Salutati, who lived from 1331 until 1406, and Leonardo Bruni, who lived from 1370 to 1444, both followers of Petrarch. Hearkening back to Cicero, Salutati and Bruni used the term studia humanitatis to describe the new pedagogy they advocated. Although they borrowed this term from Cicero, Salutati, Bruni, and later Renaissance humanists had their own distinct meaning for it, which was not the same as the meaning that Cicero offered for it. The Renaissance humanists advocated for a new kind of pedagogy, one rooted in the study of authors from Greek and Roman antiquity, and one that supposedly offered very different benefits from those encouraged by Western universities in the medieval period. To the Renaissance humanists, the goal of education was the shaping of character. And they perceived that that's what one should become educated for. You go to become an educated person and you study in order to become a good person. And humanists such as Salutati and Bruni believed that the study of ancient Latin literature and to a lesser extent ancient Greek literature was the key to shaping one's character properly. For their new curriculum, the Renaissance humanists touted the imitation of ancient Latin and the study of Latin and Greek literature, history, and moral philosophy as guides for how you ought to live your life. In pushing these subjects, the Renaissance humanists were in favor of the study of classical Latin, uh, ancient Latin, that is to say, as opposed to medieval Latin, which they perceived as dry and vulgar and unstylish. The humanists believed that the study of ancient Greek and Latin literature, history, and moral philosophy could make a person good, and that this was the goal of education, and this was the a goal of education in the humanities. Key to this conception of the Renaissance humanists was the studying of particular authors who would make you a good person. The Renaissance humanists advocated the study of classical Latin. One was both to learn from these authors and to learn to write like these authors. And according to the Renaissance humanists, certain subjects and certain authors were worthy of study, whereas other subjects and other authors were not to be studied. According to Bruni, for example, one should focus one's education on studies that pertain either to religion or the good life. In regard to religion, Bruni argued that one should focus on the early church fathers, especially Augustine. In regard to secular studies, Bruni believed that one should examine the appropriate writings from ancient Greeks and Romans on moral philosophy. More specifically, one should study their works that pertain to the good life and figure out what the good life is from reading them in the original Latin and Greek. So key to the humanities as it was originally conceived in the Renaissance was a focus on moral philosophy. And this was the kind of goal of uh, the being educated to begin with. To the Renaissance humanists, the classical writers had both literary value and moral value. The Renaissance humanists believed that classical authors such as Homer and Sallust and Caesar and Cicero and Virgil offered students both wisdom and eloquence. These studies supposedly perfected the human being and therefore this is what you should focus on when you go to school. To the thus, the Renaissance humanists, uh, thus to the Renaissance humanists, pardon me, the humanities referred to what we would now call a classical education. Their version of what the humanities was is a classical education, not our own version of what the humanities are. The focus was on Greek and Latin literature and moral philosophy at the expense of other topics. 
This is important because the Renaissance humanists became greatly influential in pushing their model of a proper education. Since it had spread throughout much of Europe by the late 16th century, Renaissance humanism was able to have the chief intellectual influence on the American colonial colleges. Accordingly, the study of ancient Greek and Roman writers became the bedrock of secondary and college education in America for centuries. It was only in the latter half of the 19th century AD that colleges and universities in the United States began to move away from a strict reliance on the Renaissance conception of the humanities as the basis for higher education. Until the late 19th century, higher education in America focused chiefly, not entirely, but chiefly on what we would now call a classical education. For this reason, when Harvard College was founded in 1636 as New College, uh, it, and I guess it loses a lot of its cachet by just being called New College rather than Harvard, but nevertheless, it was founded in 1636. It advertised the following as its standards for admission of new students. So in the 17th century, it's a little late now, but in the 17th century, if you want to get into Harvard, this is what you've got to do. Quote, when any scholar is able to read Cicero or such like classical Latin author extempore, and to make and speak true Latin verse and prose, and to climb perfectly the paradigms of nouns and verbs in the Greek tongue, then may he be admitted into the college, nor shall any claim admission before such qualifications." End quote. So, uh, no SAT scores, but it's still tough to get in, it seems to me. Um, and similarly, it was only in the late 1870s that American colleges and universities first established majors. Before that time, before the 1870s, every college student in the United States studied roughly the same prescribed curriculum, a curriculum that was dominated by the study of Latin and ancient Greek with some mathematics and other things as well. Now to us, this deep concern for ancient Greek and Latin literature may seem odd, maybe to some of you more so than others, but nevertheless, but it made sense in the context of the Renaissance and its aftermath. After all, a renewed engagement with classical Greek and Latin learning was chiefly responsible for the flourishing of Europe that began in the Renaissance. And as a result, it's not surprising that the Renaissance humanists and their followers believed that the wisdom imparted by authors from classical antiquity was the means through which to perfect the human being and to consider oneself educated. As a result of this hyper-focus on classical learning, subjects that are a regular part of contemporary colleges and universities in America actually turn out to be surprising latecomers to U.S. higher education. Harvard, for instance, only founded its first professorship in modern languages in 1816. There was no one to study any modern languages with at Harvard until 1816. In 1857, Lafayette College appointed what appears to be the first professor of English in the United States, and he was a professor of English and comparative philology, which makes it sound fancier. So there were no English professors in America until 1857. This appointment would, make, would influence other American institutions to make English a formal part of their curricula and the years following the U.S. Civil War. Yale introduced the nation's first university program in the fine arts in 1869. And the social sciences would have to wait until the late 19th century for their full inclusion in the American college curriculum. Since most, if not all, courses in early American colleges were prescribed, that is to say required of all students, the addition of new disciplines to the curriculum naturally threatened the curricular dominance of the classical languages. And surely the natural sciences amounted to the chief threat to the centering of the college curriculum around the classical languages. The Renaissance humanists had shunned the natural sciences because their studies supposedly did not contribute to the perfection of a human being. As the enlightenment of the 18th century wore on, however, the exclusion of the natural sciences had become increasingly difficult to defend. The study of the natural sciences, moreover, implicitly attacked the intellectual rationale associated with Renaissance humanism. For the Renaissance humanists, the goal, as we've talked about, of it, the goal of education was chiefly the shaping of character. The natural sciences, on the other hand, first and foremost aimed to produce new knowledge, and that was their goal instead. Especially in the course of the 19th century, many proponents of non-classical subjects added to aim those subjects, uh, add, added to add, aimed to add those subjects to the American college curriculum. And since American colleges at this time had chiefly prescribed curricula that did not allow for much student choice, the inclusion of these new subjects was naturally a threat to the place of the classical languages in higher education. 
Although there were hints of changes to come in American higher education during America's early history, these changes became far more dramatic in the aftermath of the American Civil War. The 19th century witnessed the professionalization of Western higher education, a process that was first undertaken in Germany, beginning at the very end of the 18th century and moving into the 19th century. In the course of the 19th century, first in Germany, prospective professors went through rigorous graduate studies in their field, which led them for the first time to earn PhDs, a degree for the first time you can get in the 19th century. Prior to this professionalization, teaching at American colleges seems largely to have been a temporary job rather than a career, although that might be something we're moving towards uh, ourselves in general. Uh, in early America, instruction was chiefly in the hands of the college president and typically a number of academic tutors, tutors who are themselves recent college graduates anyway. Prior to German influence on American higher education in the late 19th century, even professors in the American colleges had very little advanced training in their subjects of expertise. Most often, their presumed moral strengths recommended them for their jobs, and many would continue on to careers in ministry. Such a background fit educational institutions that were chiefly concerned with the molding of character, as Renaissance humanism was, through the inculcation of the received wisdom of the ancients. In the course of the late 19th century in America, many of these elements of early American higher education began to change as US colleges uh, uh, began to take their cues from changes that had first occurred in Germany. Professionalization, specialization, and research would ultimately become essential features of American academic life, which is also deeply humorous, I guess. For example, in the late 19th century in the U.S., the faculty of U.S. colleges split up into distinct academic departments for the first time, something that didn't exist until the late 19th century. Okay. Based, these de departments were based on their areas of expertise. So now in the late 19th century, for the first time in American higher education, you have a French department and a classics department and a biology department and so forth. The late 19th century in America also witnessed a further broadening of potential subjects to study at American institutions of higher education. Going along with this would be the removal of ancient Greek and Latin from the center of the American college curriculum. <coughs> Thus, the late 19th century America witnessed the end of the old prescribed classical curriculum. The most prominent figure associated with the demise of the old uh, prescribed classical curriculum in American higher education is a man named Charles W. Eliot, who lived from 1834 until 1926. Eliot, who was a chemist by training, became president of Harvard and was there for a long time, from 1869 until 1909. He was the president of Harvard University, and he became the most tireless advocate of the so-called free elective system. This wasn't his idea. Thomas Jefferson had come up with it earlier, but nevertheless, Eliot was the most uh, str uh, strong proponent of the so-called free elective system. Okay. Eliot advocated in favor of the replacement of the prescribed curriculum with an elective-based curriculum. In Eliot's scheme, students could choose any courses that they wanted to take. Implicit in Eliot's support for a system of elected courses was the notion of a university as a free market a space in which competition would occur between the disciplines to the supposed benefit of both the students and the disciplines themselves. Although Eliot was also clear that if individual disciplines couldn't attract students, they would disappear uh, from the university. Also implicit in the free elective system is a major change in the intellectual mission of American colleges and universities. The Renaissance humanists had argued that the study of Greek and Latin authors was key to the perfection of the human being. Now these ideas were being cast aside in the late 19th century. The free elective system implicitly signaled that there were many different kinds of knowledge and that none was necessarily more important than any other. Gone was the old idea of a unity of knowledge, that the study of a certain subject or of certain authors would make one an educated person. Instead, the free elective system contended that a college education was chiefly about introducing students to certain discipline-based skills. According to Eliot's system, one does not need to understand any specific content to deem oneself an educated person. Now, to be sure, there have been a number of reforms to Eliot's free elective system since it was first introduced in its full glory in the late 19th century. 
The Johns Hopkins University inaugurated the academic major and minor in 1877. So for the first time this major feature, if you will, of uh, contemporary academic life was started. In 1877 there were now majors and minors. The major and minor system obviously requires students to take a number of courses in a specific discipline which would become a focus of their studies. Similarly, American educators have experimented with different types of general education since the demise of the old classical curriculum in the days following the American Civil War. These days, students typically have to take a number of courses in a variety of different types of disciplines as part of their undergraduate education. I looked only very quickly, but this seems to be partly the case at Villanova. This is part of your general education. Thus, for example, as part of their general education, many students are compelled to take a class or two in the humanities, a foreign language, although that's increasingly going by the wayside, but not here, I noted with some happiness, a class in the arts, a class in the sciences, and so forth. And this is the so-called distribution model of general education, which was started in the early 20th century, and there's vestiges of it here uh, at Villanova. But importantly, these new sorts of curricula, which owe their origins to the changes that took place in higher education starting in the 19th century AD, remove the study of Greek and Roman classics from their central position in American higher education. These days, even students at the most prestigious American colleges and universities are not required to study ancient Greek and Latin. And of, I, maybe someone will know something otherwise, but of all the stu schools I've looked at, there is only one school I know of in the country that requires either Greek or Latin. St. John's, there's one campus in Santa Fe and one in Annapolis that requires two years of Greek, but that's it. It's the only place where it requires uh, this at all. And most American students, even at very prestigious American colleges and universities, do not take classics courses of any kind. In order to compete in this new intellectual and pedagogical environment, many American educators began to reconceptualize the humanities in the mid to late 19th century. So they're moving away from a Renaissance humanist conception of the humanities in the mid to late 19th century. Thanks to the Renaissance humanists, the humanities, that is to say the studia humanitatis, for centuries referred to the study of authors from Greek and Roman antiquity. As the 19th century wore on, however, opponents of academic vocationalism began to shift their arguments in favor of liberal studies more generally. Recognizing the sorry future for compulsory uh, collegiate Greek and Latin, these thinkers widened the popular conception of the humanities to encompass a sort of elevating study of literature and music and art. Right? So the humanities are no longer Latin and Greek, and they become what they are today. Um, uh, literature, music, art, philosophy. This marked a seismic shift in the arguments advanced by proponents of the humanities. They now imbued a variety of academic disciplines like English and French and philosophy with a power previously accorded to the classics alone. Hence, in the early 20th century, opponents of Eliot's free market system invented an approach to general education for American undergraduates that cast aside the former dominance of classical studies in favor of a more broad conception of the humanities. Um, in 1919, Columbia University inaugurated its core curriculum for undergraduate students. This amounted to, the, amounted to the start of the so-called great books approach to general education, which you, there are some vestiges of that at, at Villanova with a four, I think, required courses uh, for students to take, of required specific individual courses. The Columbia program, starting in 1919, aimed to introduce students to canonical authors from the Western tradition in small seminar classes. No longer were undergraduates required to study Latin and Greek, Instead, at Columbia and at other institutions that took up the great books approach, like Villanova partly, they were now compelled to read important authors from the entirety of the Western tradition and to read them in English translation rather than in Latin and Greek originals. Uh, and as I discuss in my book, such core curricula began to disappear in American higher education in the late 1960s as student radicals rebelled from required coursework and demanded more supposedly relevant topics. Strangely enough then, student radicals in the 1960s helped ensure the victory of a free market approach to general education and helped popularize a vocational approach to undergraduate studies, even though this wasn't really their ideal. All this has signaled profound challenges for classical studies and also, I think, for the humanities in the United States. From the heart of American higher education, the classics have become a kind of boutique discipline. 
According to the U.S. Department of Education's National Center for Education Statistics in 2011 and 2012, in the 2011 and 2012 academic year, there were close to 4,000 two-year and four-year colleges and universities in the United States. But only around 400 of such institutions have classics departments. Hence, Americans who choose to major in classics routinely have to explain what the classics are to people who ask them what their major is. As a classics major myself, and now I guess I'm never going to escape this as a classics professor, I've had people ask me whether I study Charles Dickens, or even one person asked me whether I play the piano. Uh, I don't, is I guess the answer to that question, or not particularly well. Um, to, to those who did not attend a certain type of high school or college or university, classical studies don't mean anything anymore. In the broader picture, as I argue in my book, the free elective system popularized by Charles Eliot at Harvard has caused all sorts of problems for higher education and all sorts of problems for the humanities. This is not to suggest, and I want to make this clear because it makes it seem as if I wish I were living in Italy in the 14th century. This is not uh, my idea here. This is not to suggest the Renaissance humanists offered an unproblematic curriculum to which we should simply return. I wonder how long it would take Villanova to close if we decided to go back to a re strict Renaissance conception of, of Latin and Greek as the basis of every one of your educations, I would imagine, pretty soon. Um, Renaissance humanism had numerous weaknesses and seems unfit for the contemporary world. But at least the Renaissance humanists had a vision of what it means to be an educated person, and they chose content that they thought would be most conducive to the creation of that educated person. <coughs> the free elective system, by contrast, implicitly signals to students that content does not matter. As long as one can learn a handful of discipline-based skills, one can deem oneself an educated person. It is not a surprise that many students find this vision of education hollow and they react by choosing a course of studies that seems either the easiest or the most pragmatic, or possibly both. It's uh, entertaining, there's a Reddit site for UMD where I teach, and you can see there's always a mega course thread at the beginning, and every time people ask, what course should I take on this, and so forth, and every one of them says, what's the easiest computer science course? What's the easiest history class? What's the easiest English class, and so forth. Every once in a while someone says, is this professor kind of fun, or something like that, but by and large, everything is, what's the easiest, what have you. And this is the way, at Maryland it seems, and I'm sure throughout the country, people tend to think about general education. What's the easiest, way of me, and I have to confess with uh, math and science, I did that too, uh, what are the easiest ways uh, to get out of this requirement? The free elective system also treats students as consumers, and this has caused all manner of problems in American higher education. Without a vision of what it means to be an educated person, students, especially in trying economic times, typically turn to vocationalism. This is one major reason why the humanities today are not faring very well at all on many American college campuses uh, throughout the nation. It should be also be clear why the history I've offered seri uh, signals serious challenges for classical studies in the US. And this is why the academic culture wars focus chiefly on the study of English literature rather than the classics. Uh, well before the 1980s, the classics had passed the torch of the humanities to English departments, which had become the dominant element in the new humanities. Thus combatants in the academic culture wars of the 1980s and 1990s were often unaware that our conception of the, of the humanities is very much a 19th century one, distinct from and opposed to <laughs> centuries of Western higher education. Again, I am not arguing that a return to the spirit of Renaissance humanism will cure everything for American higher education. But I do believe that the dominant approach to general education in the US in colleges and universities presents an impoverished view of what it means to be an educated person, one that implicitly contends that discipline-based skills are the sole attainments of an educated man and an educated woman. To thrive in the present and in the future, humanists need to fight against this system in favor of a more concrete vision of what it means to be an educated person. Thank you very much. Thank you.
Right. Um, uh, right. Right. No, thank you. That's a, a, a very pertinent question, seems to me, and I think that that's often offered. First of all, this notion that um, the Renaissance led to this uh, great flourishing of Europe, although I think partly true, at, at the same time it's a kind of um, a simplification. There are lots of medievalists would, who perceive that this, these distinctions between uh, the medieval period to the Renaissance have been overplayed, oftentimes by Renaissance scholars who want to talk about the importance of their period at the expense of the medieval period and so forth. And so we can overplay that, it seems to me. And if you actually look at the medieval period, it's deeply Aristotelian. There are lots of classical texts focused on that too. And so there are similarities, not just differences, between medieval scholasticism uh, and the Renaissance. At the same time, it seems to me, unless you're willing to throw out tradition entirely, we're not just talking about a conception that was important during the Renaissance, but for the vast majority of Western history, um, that people have looked back to the ancients directly, going back really for the Romans who look back to the Greeks, and Greeks who look back to earlier Greeks and so forth. And Greek and Latin learning has been deeply important, not just during the Renaissance, but throughout all of Western history, essentially. There's a great diminution of that at the late 19th century as we move to a very different sort of curriculum. But it seems to me that you, if you want to argue that being a good person today is different from being a good person in the Renaissance, you're sort of arguing in a way, being a good person today is different from being a good person throughout the vast majority of human experience. I'm not so sure that that makes that much sense. If you believe that, then we shouldn't read anything old, it seems to me. We should just look at Google or something like that, I guess, for our own. And I don't think anyone really believes that, it seems to me. So I think that that gives us a very kind of presentist and impoverished kind of notion, it seems to me. Seventeenth, yeah. Yeah. And the, and the focus on, okay, now we've got German studies, which are one of the great German thinkers. Most mm -hmm. of the great German thinkers haven't been writing. I mean, it's just that you haven't yeah. taken the paper yet. So then I think um, it just sort of, it, it follows the Roman model of, uh, like, Roman, Roman mm -hmm. literariness coming into its own, like, the Augustine period, right? Then yeah. there's Roman literature. Now there's yeah. English literature. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I do think, the, I mean, that's a good point that obviously some authors who are perceived as canonical today weren't writing then, so they weren't going to be able to see this. I, I understand that. At the same period of time, Bruni, when he advocates in favor of people reading the early church fathers, particularly Augustine, he was opposed to them reading uh, more, Im you know, uh, Aquinas. Right? And so from the medieval period, because he thought he wrote dry and vulgar and unstylish kind of scholastic sort of Latin, and so this was someone he was uninterested in. So people who are obviously deeply important to us today, he didn't think were important. He wanted to focus on this particular period. I mean, there was Beowulf and Gilgamesh and so forth. There were other things one could read, right? It's not just suddenly in the 19th century, Americans suddenly, or, or those in Europe recognized how to write or something like that. There were other authors that could have been important, but this is not what they focused on. Obviously, they had, I think, think a very narrow notion of uh, what's important, right? what texts can be great and so forth. And they venerated the Greeks and Romans to such a great extent that they sort of discluded the vast majority of human experience. That I think is untenable today and not the direction that humanity should move in. But at the same time, it seems to me one of the things that we should think about that's a, a valuable model for us about how the Renaissance humanists were so successful in get, implementing their model in Western higher education is that they had the fortitude intellectually to suggest that particular content was conducive to making people educated. Right? And it seems to me that that's what the vast majority of institutions in America lack. Instead, they just sort of say, take a history class. I don't really particularly care which one. Study a language. It doesn't make any bit of difference which one it is, right? Um, take a math class. It doesn't matter what level and so forth. It makes no difference, right? And if that's the case, then students naturally react by, what's the easiest math class? What's the easiest history class? and so forth. I think that's naturally the direction they move if the institution is unwilling to say that this content makes you an educated person. Right? And that's where I would actually applaud Villanova, which has some courses where it is actually saying that this material is required. I would imagine, I don't know, there are people who know this more than I, I would imagine that that core component of the curriculum at Villanova used to be larger, and the choose your own adventure component was smaller, and it's gotten bigger over time to try to get more students to show up. That would be my guess. But it seems to me that that's an example of kind of buying into the market. 
Right? And I say this in part, I mean, it's easy for me to say I'm a classics professor. Obviously, my own, uh, our own interests are involved in this as well. But I had that kind of curriculum, too, when I was an undergraduate. And I made some choices about classes to take. And I made some good choices, and I made some bad choices. By and large, if, particularly in certain subjects, I was just scared of those subjects. I got myself to believe that I wasn't good at them. And so I wa wanted to hunt for whatever was the easiest class. And now as I look back on that, it seems peculiar, perverse in fact to me, that I was asked to choose my classes to try to determine what it means to be an educated person when I wasn't yet educated. That seems like a strange choice under the circumstances. And so I feel in a way I can't be blamed that I made some dumb choices when I was an undergraduate because I was receiving basically no guidance. And in many cases, I was choosing my classes on the basis of you know, which didn't meet at 8.30 in the morning uh, and which ones didn't have a lab you know, and, and these kinds of things. right? I don't think that's a great reason to choose your classes, it seems to me. Yeah. Trying to get out of Greek and Latin, sure. Yeah. Yeah. Like, right. Suck. Right. Right. I'm arguing. So right. Right. I am. Ar I'm. Yeah. Right. I agree. Now, I'm not arguing that students suddenly in the late 19th century became lazy when previously yeah. they were all just dutiful and wonderful and so. This is obviously not the case, right? But it does seem to me that that a college or a university actually stands for something when it believes that certain kinds of content are really important to shaping a human being. Right? And that that seems to be important. Not every student's going to buy into that, right? Um, but it does seem to me that that's fundamentally important. And when you say instead that, ah, choose whatever you want, right? Un under those circumstances, I think people naturally tend toward whatever the culture tends toward. toward. And so the culture is in favor of the kind of consumer market, so people choose whatever is most vocational. I'm not sure that ultimately they're best served by that choice. When maybe when they, in college they feel that way, but 20 years down the line afterwards, they may not feel the same way. Yes, sir. How could you even go about starting the process on doing the commercialization and appeal to the market that led it to be in the state of this current? I think it's impo that's a great question. I think that it's impossible, it seems to me, in, in, in large part, that you suddenly aren't going to market yourself at all, you know, or what have you. In some ways, a, a kind of return to uh, earlier traditions would have to be marketed in order to work, right? Uh, it seems to me in, in, in some ways. And so you're going to ultimately have to do that. But at the same time, it seems to me that the curriculum itself is not just a list of courses to take, but it's a blueprint for the kind of citizens that we want to create. And if you basically say, choose your own courses, you're essentially saying that what you want to do is you want to have a kind of Darwinian competition right, uh, among students as consumers. And I think then you're offering a kind of vision of what it means to be an educated person. By fighting against that system, you're saying that you think that being an educated person is different from that. So I think that the curricular uh, model that we have, that the dominant curricular model, is an embodiment of that capitalism, if you will, and an embodiment of that Darwinism, right? And by merely by moving away from it, by sort of suggesting uh, moving in other directions, um, philosophically, you're actually fighting against that system. Does that mean that we're suddenly going to live in some, you know, uh, Valhalla that we're in which there's no market or something like that? No, obviously that's not the case. But at the same period of time, I do think that it's an important movement in, uh, towards saying that we think that being educated shouldn't strictly be determined by the needs of the market. Yes. 
Yes. And that's actually very interesting. There's a wonderful comment, and it seems to me that's, that's actually very important. If you look at, say, the work of Adam Smith, who's someone you would think would be unsympathetic to this, he actually was greatly supportive of the humanities and the liberal arts more generally because he was very worried um, that society was moving in a direction through free market capitalism in which people were going to become essentially just little factory workers who were going to blow their brains out, essentially, because they had they, what they were doing was so mundane in their own lives. And he thought it was deeply important to be educated in a broad fashion so that they were able to be democratic citizens, essentially. Um, people who were willing to fight for their country, people who cared, right? People who weren't suicidal, essentially. And so I, I agree with that. Um, it is also the case that sort of progressive education, which I don't think we should demonize because I think that there are valuable things that have come from it, have, have, has tended to look at uh, earlier education, particularly in, uh, in special ways that have probably been detrimental as well. So that, for instance, instance when I went to primary school, uh, we didn't learn any grammar. I don't know, for some reason, people just thought that was unimportant or what have you. And as a result, uh, it was only when I started to take Latin and Greek that I actually learned that there's a pluperfect or, you know, and th these kind of, I had no idea, right? Nothing at all. So for some reason, someone just determined, it seems it was largely Herbert Spencer and then John Dewey and so forth, we get these kind of ideas, right? Um, and as a result, people now don't write that well, it seems to me in part, right? And again, I don't want to valorize previous education. There was all kinds of problems with it and so forth. And so we shouldn't focus on the notion that the past was just so wonderful, right? Um, cutting out the natural sciences is absurd. You can't, you can't do that in today's day and age. But it does seem to me that we do need, I, and I agree, not only at the higher education level, but in primary and secondary school as well, to reevaluate some of our priorities. Because we get the kind of citizens that we deserve from the sort of education that we offer them. Yeah. 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 I mean, well, first of all, if we if we all strut around as classics professors and talk about how darn important we are in comparison with everyone else, it seems to me that that's maybe a recipe for failure ultimately. <laughs> um, but at this, you know, because I bet you there are many people in the math department who don't agree. You know, it strikes me, and I just pick math. You know, here and there, it's not that there's anything uh, about mathematics. But at the same time, when university disciplines or uh, academic disciplines ended up professionalizing, they tended to focus on much smaller units of knowledge. And so gone from classics was the notion that these authors could actually serve as conduits for living the good life, that you could learn, you know, so if you take a class on Plato, maybe, I mean, Plato's maybe a bad example, because maybe in a philosophy department that's more likely to be focused on. But with a lot of classical authors, they don't really do this uh, today in classics departments in the way that they advocated for, for in the Renaissance and the Renaissance among the humanists themselves. So you don't read Tacitus to learn, you know, what, what kind of a person should you be like, right? Now, I do think that using these uh, authors merely as a conduit for your own notion of the good life is um, presentist and problematic in certain ways. But I do think that classics should do a better job of actually selling itself, if you will, um, as an opportunity for people to understand what the good life is and to think about major questions about what it means to be human and what is justice and what is truth and what is good and what is beauty and so forth. And oftentimes I think classics professors are a little bit better about telling you why that's in the genitive case than they are about those kind of broader questions. It comes, it seems to me, from the kind of training we receive, but that training is something that maybe we need to fight against a little bit. Oh, God. I quote at the beginning of your second chapter about um, uh, excellent translations of almost all these great works exist. Uh -huh. And I, I teach a great book course yeah. where we read every single translation. Right? Sure. I, I right. teach Latin and Greek. Sure. So, in that sense, what does the classics department offer that is yeah. different now that we have these? Yeah, uh, that's a great question. I think it's, it's often asked. It seems to me that we need, I don't think, I'm not advocating that everyone should study Latin and Greek. It would really help uh, Dr. Scott, it seems to me, if everyone at Villanova were forced to do so. In Maryland, we'd have 38,000 
uh, undergraduate. I don't know what we would do. A massive expansion of our own department and so forth. I'm not sure how we'd get ab about doing that. Uh, but I'm not in f necessarily in favor of that. But I do at the same time believe that we need some people, and I think that this is very valuable to their own education, to have direct access to works of fundamental importance to our own civilization. And that if you have to use the mediation of a translation, although it's better than nothing, it seems to me it's much better to read Plato in translation than not to read him. But if you can't read directly, then you aren't getting the same sort of experience. Right? And so I think a lot is lost in translation because you are reading only through the mediation of a translator. Um, and so I do think we need some people who are able, not everyone who goes to college it seems to me, but we do need some people um, who see that value and who are willing to experience that. And that also strikes, so we, there's a language requirement at many universities, not actually at Maryland. There is only for the humanities, although there's various ways to fudge that too and so forth. Um, but oftentimes when there are language requirements, they're seen merely as an opportunity to learn a language that you might use when you're on vacation um, or maybe on a business trip. Right? And so seldom do universities sell you on the notion that the reason to study a foreign language is to be able to get uh, unfiltered access to a great work. Right? Which is not only the, in Latin and Greek, but in many other languages as well. I think that's really important, it seems to me. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it begins with the sort of shift in the university model where universities are now becoming, uh, even if not publicly, sort of for profit companies where they're being run more like businesses, mm -hmm. yeah. rise of the administrative state. Yep, yep. The fall of the faculty, yeah. um, professors, online courses, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, yeah. Yep. Humanities majors um, in three years will make significantly less than business majors, but in 15 years actually have yep. higher. Yep. Um, yep. You know, and so they sort of make concessions. Mm -hmm. um, and so if you take Villanova, for example, an ambitious university, mm -hmm. I don't think that, you know, it might convince us, but I don't think if you were to go to the administration <laughs> yeah. and explain to them yeah. your project, they, mm -hmm. I think they say, we apologize, but we're not right. buying. Right. And so my I agree with that. is what do um, families do going mm -hmm. forward? Mm -hmm. um, because like, I don't see a place like Villanova going in the right direction. Mm -hmm. I don't see mm -hmm. um, most universities going in the right direction. So what is the responsibility yeah. of individuals and of families yeah. who see the value in these things? Yeah. Do, you, do you attend the sort of tiny classical colleges popping up in right. the West and in the Midwest? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Right. You know that has right. A strong reputation or yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, uh, thank you. It's an excellent question. I think you packed a lot into it. First of all, I would say that the kind of change to the free elective system is precisely how all of this stuff grew. Right, so that we have an administrative university and we have this kind of neoliberal university in which you know, many professors now are adjuncts who make $13 a year with no health care and so forth who teach 83 classes and you know, blah, blah, blah. And this all seems to stem ultimately from the decision to see the curriculum as a kind of free market. Right? And um, I think that that sort of makes sense under those circumstances. Um, it also strikes me that we, What's important is not necessarily to, although I think we have to make some of those arguments, it's not to focus as humanists on those arguments about how much you're going to earn when you're done. Um, so one thing, I, I'm a fan, and here I think I'm in good company, I'm a fan of college basketball, um, although here I'm not in good company. It's because I went to Duke as a, for grad school, and so I, you know, Villanova, eh. Well, anyway. Um, and when you watch college basketball on television, they often give a little spot to the college to do a little kind of, uh, advertisement for itself, you know, and you have this 30 second advertisement of what's going on at Villanova today and so on. And it, w without doubt, every one of those advertisements always talks about they're really close to curing cancer, 
Um, and they found a way for monkeys to do this and that, you know, and so forth. And robots, and there's like some guy with a robot in this very high-tech lab and so forth. And they talk about Villanova, there you go. And they show you sort of a, like a building looks like a Greek temple, but everything is about, you know, cancer. They're just so close to cancer. And everything seems, by and large, everything seems like it's focused on what you might call humanitarianism rather than humanism, to make a distinction um, that the great social critic Irving Babbitt made was very critical, the, the move toward universities in this direction. Um, I don't think there's a problem with humanitarianism, but I think universities should also be about humanism too, and about self-perfection. And it seems to me that it's really important for the humanities to argue that that's what they do, rather than to argue that they incul inculcate critical thinking, which you can get in any department, it seems to me, if as long as you're thinking okay, right? Or that we'll, we'll slightly out-earn, or well, an engineering will give you a bit, bit more of a salary, but 10 years down the line, it won't be so bad, right? I don't think those are good arguments for the humanities. I think instead, a university should also focus, not just focus, but also focus on the idea that you'll be a better person when you leave, or at least that's a possibility, right? Universities don't advocate for themselves in this way. Instead, I think they focus merely on humanitarianism. There's nothing wrong with humanitarianism, but they shouldn't focus only on it, it seems to me. Yeah, well, no, he'd be delighted to meet me, I'm sure. Yeah. <laughs> uh, all right, we'll make, oh yeah, Mira, we'll do one more question. And then we'll yeah. No, no, no. Sorry. Yeah, right. you're holding everybody out from, <laughs> from lunch or dinner. Or. Yeah, right. And here's where I think some of the pragmatic arguments have to be made, right? And one thing that I didn't stress in the talk, but I think that is important for recognizing the value, the, the perceived value of Latin and Greek, is in the early days of American higher education, you went to college largely to join ultimately one of the so-called learned professions, right? Ministry, law, or medicine. And those were professions in which you needed to have a grounding in the classical languages in order to be part of them. So it was obvious why you went to study those things. And over the course of the 19th century, it became less obvious because you no longer needed those things, it seems to me. Um, also, uh, in the early days, such small percentages of Americans were going to college that you were already seen as a kind of part of the elite if you went. Right? And so there was a kind of uh, intellectual cachet and social cachet from having studied these things too. Um, that hasn't completely disappeared. There's a kind of class system associated with whether you went to college and so forth today too. Um, but some of that, you know, when you have only you know, one percent of Americans going to college and so forth, some of that sort of starts to disappear. There it seems to me that you do need to educate people in a pragmatic manner about um, the sorts of benefits that this sort of education offers. And in many cases I think what you can do is say that if you are getting strictly vocational and narrow training that you will have a career path that is maybe particularly obvious, but if some technology changes or that business goes offshore, you're now trained for nothing. But if you are broadly trained, not just in the classics, but in history and various other subjects as well, and you've been trained how to think, and you've looked at great works and so forth, and you, you understand these things, that it seems to me that there's all kinds of possibilities for your own jobs that you can have. And in some ways, in this particular market, that's probably more beneficial. Um, because it seems that being trained for lots of things is probably better in our unstable market than being trained for narrow things. The problem though is I don't want only those arguments because those arguments are really pragmatic, utilitarian arguments that reinforce the way that universities work. I recognize that people are concerned when they send their kids to college, they don't want to spend all this money so that I'm glad you're a perfect human being who lives in my basement, right? They, there are reasonable <laughs> concerns that people have under those circumstances, but I still do think we need to stress um, the kind of moral benefit, if you will, of being an educated person. Um, and I think that um, doing so can start fighting against some of this tension of merely seeing this as job training, which I think it's partly job training, but it's also training for the rest of your life. So I think if you want to start
Thank you very much. You're very patient. Thank you.